From the investigators behind Ghost Hunters comes a new series. I'm willing to immerse myself into a haunted location. Using cutting edge paranormal technology. Come and touch this one more time for me. This is like freezing, this thing is so cold. To uncover some of Kentucky's greatest mysteries. We're really spanning the spectrum of American history. We got a spirit come through. I'm positive it was Jesse James. Haunted Discoveries on TNE. You know, my name is Brandon Alvis. I'm the founder of the American Paranormal Research Association. Uh, founded the organization in 2006 to solely investigate historical locations throughout the United States. Uh, uh, my name is Mustafa Gadalari. I started investigating the paranormal at 18 years of age. I was very intrigued by a series of haunted occurrences that occurred in my childhood home. Yeah, you know, my name is Brandon Alvis. I'm the founder of the American Paranormal Research Association. Uh, founded the organization in 2006 to solely investigate historical locations throughout the United States. And, you know, my interest in the paranormal began at a very young age. In 1995, I lost my oldest brother to cancer. In 2004, I lost another brother to suicide. So that kind of sent me on my journey into the unexplained, if you will, and trying to find credible proof that there is consciousness that survives death. My name is Mustafa Gadalari. I, I started investigating the paranormal at 18 years of age after I was very intrigued by a series of haunted occurrences that occurred in my childhood home. And I had repressed them for a while, and then I wanted to learn more about them. So then I went and started assisting members of the Albanian uh, Muslim community and other Muslim families that I knew and Albanian cousins. and help them with uh, their home hauntings or what they believe to be paranormal activity. And that kind of just spiraled into a larger interest of the paranormal and various haunted locations in the tri-state area. And then now um, all across America. Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, my parents, they originated from Albania and they were peasant class. So if you notice, like around a lot of farmers and stuff from that part of the world, they're very highly superstitious. Um, and then due to the nature of the Turkish Ottoman, um, some would call it an invasion or whatever, however, that's the word that comes to my mind, but the influence of Turkish Ottomans uh, breathed in a lot of Islamic cultural beliefs into the area. So then that native superstition got combined with Islamic beliefs. So all paranormal activity in um, a lot of like Muslim Albanian regions is attributed to jinn. Albanians call them jinnas, but like in the Islamic uh, faith, a jinn are believed to be these entities that are responsible for paranormal occurrences uh, and stuff of that nature. So, uh, yeah, I, I definitely started off researching jinn a lot, looking into hadith and, you know, Quranic mentions of it, but then also other older Arab scriptures that uh, deal with uh, jinn and all of that. So uh, it's, it's pretty intriguing stuff. And there's a lot of commonalities that other cultures who have ghost stories, it's all very, 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 very similar. Um, a lot of times, those are the stories that pop up the most, but in the Islamic faith, jinn are just believed to be entities that reside in a different plane of existence. And they can just like human beings be either good or bad. Yeah, Muslim jinn, apparently, um, and then, like, you know, you'll be praying and then you don't know, maybe there's a jinn behind you praying too, which is uh, for me as a kid, that was an awesome thought. I'll be like, oh, cool, man. I wonder if I have some gin friends just like hanging out with me, <laughs> like helping me. I'm like, I wish they'd help me be better at Street Fighter against my older brother, but no, no dice. I think those stories kind of originated from the fact that people are participating in dark magic practices that enlist help of the gin, but that's to believed to be like a big no no. Once you start getting help from a gin, then in the Islamic faith, that's believed to be that you are turning to a creation of God to help rather than God himself. And, uh, that doesn't make God too happy. And then you'll, I think you'll burn for that um, from, from my estimation. So that's the way I grew up. I don't know. Maybe other sects of Muslims will tell you different. Never had an experience growing up. Uh, it was just more about having to learn about death at a very young age and try and cope with that the best way I could. And, you know, I've always talked about how paranormal investigation is almost like a form of grief therapy in a lot of ways and kind of facing that, that, ultimate question that we're all as human beings going to meet one day and that's death the, you know the ultimate end for all of us and so i've always been a natural skeptic um looking for answers and trying to find quantifiable data to support the idea of ghosts and haunting so uh, for me it's always been you know since you know 95 a lifelong search for those uh, answers and hopefully 
as we go along, one day we'll find it. Yeah, like we always say, it's like the ultimate unifier, right? Uh, you know, we all have differences as humans. We all come from different backgrounds and cultural beliefs, but we're all going to meet that in one day. Well, you know, Mustafa and I worked on uh, Amy's Ghost Hunters together, and that's how we met. Um, you know, I founded APRA in 2006, but, you know, once Ghost Hunters ended and we wanted to continue our research, we thought this would be the best avenue possible. I mean, um, I know Brandon was looking for a facility to turn to a research center for the American Paranormal Research Association. And the idea from that sprung from like everybody that we talked to and all of our research that we conducted on haunted locations found that there was a highly concentrated area of haunted uh, locations in Kentucky. And we started our journey for haunted discoveries in Old Louisville, which is purportedly, um, and I think there's a really good case for it to be made that it is America's most haunted neighborhood. And uh, we've had some pretty stunning finds uh, and, uh, throughout all of Kentucky, but in Old Louisville uh, especially. Um, there's just something about that place. There's something about the homes there. I don't know if there was a specific cultural thing that was happening and that energy that got captured there. Anything I would say would be theory, uh, but very, very, very compelling stuff that we found in Old Louisville. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think we saw some evidence of that in um, Gilded Age Ghosts, our first episode of Haunted Discoveries, which premiered yesterday on TNE, and then um, we have another old Louisville location in season one of Haunted Discoveries. Um, that's going to be airing on Friday the thirteenth on TNE as well at nine p.m. Uh, really cool that we get to have it on Friday the thirteenth. So uh, last night we got some really, really, really compelling um, physical and audio uh, evidence documented, but in um, this next episode, we have a, a really stunning uh, find of a different variety that I think people yeah. are going to freak out over. I would say, you know, my almost 20 years of doing this, this is the most significant piece of footage we've ever collected. And not only a piece of footage, but captured on a very sensitive scientific piece of equipment in the CCD camera, which is an electron multiplying camera. So for us to have the opportunity to use this very sensitive scientific piece of equipment in a paranormal investigation, but also to collect what we did uh, at the Bourbon Inn, mind blowing stuff for sure. Yeah. I mean, in, in terms of, I, I'll touch upon like the idea of like abilities first. Like, I, I don't necessarily think that, you know, ab abilities are something that like you can like rely on for an investigation. That's just not our MO. I do think though that the way you're operating and the sincerity that you bring into an investigation is what resonates with the purported entities there. And if you're coming in with those good intentions, it's like, you know, Indiana Jones and the last crusade, you know, you walk the invisible bridge. If you're willing to take that step into the unknown of like your research and, and being like, I don't know if this experiment's going to work, but I really want to, I sincerely want to find the answer to this or just really air out the truth. And because we've been working sincerely a lot, I, I've, I've been able to get more, document more stuff with Brandon as a result of our pursuits. We never go into an investigation and I'll, and I'll repeat that again. We never go into an investigation thinking we want to document this. We want to to do this experiment, we want to test this theory, and we want to tell this part of the history of this location and try our best. So that's what we go in with uh, every investigation. As a result, we've, we've yielded some pretty, pretty cool stuff, but we do rely on equipment. Yeah, and also we also bring in people from other belief systems in our investigations as well. Like you'll see that in episode two, um, that's airing Friday the 13th, um, that we bring in a, a a spiritismo, a spiritismo, excuse me. She's someone that, you know, practices a very specific form of spiritual belief. And we bring her into our investigation and monitor the environmental conditions around her style of looking into the paranormal. And we actually, again, have a really stunning find associated with it. Ooh, man. I mean, um, like Brandon mentioned, we have the EMCCD camera, the electron multiplying camera that's used in very specific instances. And we've captured some great stuff. But uh, Brandon... This is something that I admire. APRA has been doing this from a long time ago. It's sometimes investigators, they'll use like really kind of um, really, really low grade audio recorders and devices that, you know, purportedly capture, you know, ghosts. I think it's just because they're crummy audio recorders. That's why you get things that sound like EVPs. But Brandon and APRA have been implementing really high fidelity audio equipment. Um, 
And, you know, he's a musician um, and he understands the importance of, of good high fidelity audio. And we implement a lot of really great uh, pieces of, of a lot of great microphones and audio recorders in our investigations. So like, yeah. yeah. And with anything we use, we want to have quantifiable data associated with it. So if it can't give us factual information and data that can be tested by a third party, it's something we typically don't use. So like Mustafa talked about with the high fidelity, the high fidelity audio devices, that gives us a higher bit rate recording, which can then give us more information within a spectrum analysis and really show us if we're dealing with straight radio frequencies or cell phone frequencies and really hone it down. But again, it comes down to the fact that if we can't collect data from a device, we typically do not use it within our investigation. Absolutely. You know, that's the most important part of the investigation really is the analysis. And once we find something that we can't explain, that's when we send that out to third parties that can really give us an understanding, uh, you know, experts within these devices that really know how they work, what kind of false positives they can give and what is truly something they can't explain. So anytime we collect something we don't know about, can't further our uh, knowledge base about, that's when we go to someone else. Yeah, I mean, there's really nothing more. If, you, if you're if you're par doing paranormal investigations to get the thrill of collecting like compelling evidence, there's nothing more scary or thrilling than vetting all of your data, all of the stuff that you have, and then you send it to somebody else who has nothing to do with paranormal research, and they go, "I don't know what the hell that is." That's pretty scary. Like you know, that's pretty cool. Like to, if you're able to do that and. We've been fortunate enough to have several instances where that was the case with us. And we just have our, a really high standard for ourselves, not to sound all arrogant. We do. And um, if we can meet or exceed that, cool. Ooh, I, I would say some of the best evidence from season one has to be this next episode that's about to air on uh, Friday the 13th. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing to go into a place that has a myth or an urban legend associated with it that's been told for a century and you really can't find any historical documentation to necessarily support what's been talked about in oral legends. And then we go in there and we kind of replicate some of those things and we have stunning finds associated with it. Yeah, it's not just the evidence that we documented there. It's the process of how we did it and then also the implications as to what that evidence means, because then it completely changes the nature of what we think a haunting is or what could create a haunting that's what's really really cool to me and that's a that's a theory we've been implementing in every single one of our cases we've always kept that under consideration on every single one of our investigations moving forward so it's very very cool it was like again this is a word that gets tossed around a lot but it genuinely was a life-changing experience i there's no way i can convey that like effectively right now but it was life-changing without hyperbole from the investigators behind Ghost Hunters comes a new series. I'm willing to immerse myself into a haunted location. Using cutting edge paranormal technology. Come and touch this one more time for me. This is like freezing, this thing is so cold. To uncover some of Kentucky's greatest mysteries. We're really spanning the spectrum of American history. We got a spirit come through. I'm positive it was Jesse James. Haunted Discoveries on TNE.